Started. So we're talking about um, congenital anomalies of the corneal scleral and globe. Um, this is a pretty quick lecture. We'll just kind of go over um, a bunch of conditions here. It'll stop me anytime. But first, I'm going to do a little um, outline or a little kind of introduction to kind of the embryonal origins of the anterior segment. Um, so the cornea and the sclera do come from a few different. Um, I guess, embryonal tissues. The surface ectoderm is responsible for the corneal epithelium. Um, most of the cornea and sclera does come from the neural crust, um, which is going to give rise to corneal stroma and endothelium, um, pretty much all of the sclera and also the iris. The mesoderm, however, does contribute to a small area of sclera temporally. So with neural crest cell migration, there are um, three main waves um, that come in early on. So wave one occurs at week four, where the neural crest migrates centrally to form the corneal endothelium and the stroma. Um, wave two comes at week seven, where the cells start to invade the corneal stroma, and then um, they also will condense as sclera and migrate posteriorly. And the third wave at week eight, um, the neural crest advances to form iris stroma. Um, later on, by the third month, um, the corneal endothelium thins down to one layer. By the twelfth week, the eyelid folds neat and fuse, and then the conjunctiva and the corneal epithelium start to develop away from the amniotic fluid once the eyelid folds have formed, um, and the decimase membrane becomes a continuous structure. By the fourth month, the keratocytes within the stroma align and uh, collagen and the mella are laid down. Um, so there are many causes of congenital corneal anomalies, starting with um, intrinsic factors, genetic factors. Um, there can be impaired cellular induction and proliferation, defective cell migration, um, abnormal cell death, uh, abnormal extracellular uh, substrates, inadequate differentiation, um, as well as physical constraints. Um, extrinsically, there are um, also um, factors such as maternal health. Um, and external teratogens such as radiation, the torch infections, and medications. Um, so we'll go through kind of a bunch of conditions here. So cryptophthalmos is a condition where there's um, there's actually no eyelids, lashes, or eyebrows, and the cornea is fused with the epidermis. Um, there may or may not be an interchamber iris or lens, um, and this can be unilateral or bilateral. Um, Microphthalmos is perhaps a bit more common. Um, this refers, refers to a small malformed globe, um, and there can be an associated cyst or cystic outpouching. Um, and microphthalmos occurs when there is, um, or is associated with a failure of uh, fetal fissure to close properly. Colobomatous defects are common. Um, there are other um, ocular associations that are usually present, including persistent fetal va vasculature. And there are a variety of causes for microphthalmos. It can be autosomal dominant, it can be recessive, it can be associated with other systemic syndromes, um, it can occur with uh, torch infections. So um, there are a multitude of causes there. Um, this is a patient I saw um, who was an inpatient who had. We didn't do an ultrasound to confirm whether or not it was kind of no right eye versus a uh, kind of a microphthalmic eye. Um, we were treating him for this left eye, which had a very, very shallow orbit, um, severe exposure. I mean, this is, he wasn't able to close his lid at all. And as you can tell, he's got severe hydrocephalus, severe um, kind of cleft deformities. And he was, or his mother was told that he wasn't gonna live more than like a few days. So we were just going to temporize him, we put in a bandage contact lens, he kept living. So then we put in um, a scleral, an inpatient scleral contact lens while he was in-house. Um, so he's the youngest patient I've used the scleral contact lenses on, and he did great. He kept living, he actually got discharged, um, mom was putting in a bandage contact lens um, every so often, and I think he lived uh, like at least 18 months um, before he, I don't know what happened to him. He decided his mom wanted to take him elsewhere for care. Um, this is, uh, so next we'll talk about nanophthalmos. So as opposed to microphthalmos, which is a small malformed globe, this is a small, relatively normal eye. 
and um, there's usually very high hyperopia because of the short axial length. Usually that axial length is about 15 to 20 uh, millimeters, normal axial length around 23, 24 millimeters. Um, there is a very thickened sclera, and the lens volume is higher than it is in a normal eye, and so that can result in anterior segment crowding, angle closure glaucoma. Um, because there is thickened sclera, that thickened sclera can often um, kind of impede the venous outflow through the vortex veins during cataract surgery. So you do have to watch for uh, choroidal effusions or choroidal hemorrhage during cataract surgery, and one can consider prophylactic sclerotomies. Um, a blue sclera is um, kind of almost the opposite as far as sclera goes. Um, the student uvia being seen through a diffusely thin sclera. Um, this is seen in osteogenesis imperfecta type 1, which is an autosomal dominant condition, which is associated with bone fragility, also associated with Ehlers-Danlos type 6, which is um, autosomal recessive, and it's associated with um, joint hyperextensibility and cardiac um, issues, as well as other systemic issues. Um, but this is not something that we typically treat, just something that's noted, not, nothing that's progressive. Uh, microcornea is a condition where the cornea is less than 10 millimeters, um, but it is clear, it's got a normal pachymetry. Um, it is relatively flat, however, so that gives uh, people usually a hyperopic correction. Um, and because it's relatively flat, it's also, um, there may be a higher risk of angle closure with a more shallow anterior chamber. It's associated with um, other anomalies such as persistent uh, fetal vasculature, congenital cataracts, anterior segment dysgenesis, and optic nerve hypoplasia. And there are a variety of conditions that can lead to a microcornea, including myotonic, myotonic dystrophy, fetal alcohol syndrome, and Ehlers-Danlos. Um, as opposed to megalocornea, so megalocornea is X-linked. Uh, the diameter in megalocornea is greater than 13 millimeters. Um, there are um, very steep um, K values, and you can tell it's a very large, very steep cornea. Um, it's histologically normal. This is not a progressive enlargement. Um, one does need to um, distinguish megalocornea from congenital glaucoma, especially in a, a young patient, so checking IOP would be the distinguishing factor. Um, um, also, with megalocornea, it is relatively clear, so you don't get the corneal clouding that you sometimes see with uh, congenital glaucoma. Um, it's, uh, megalocornea is associated with meiosis, iostroma, atrophy, cataract and glaucoma, and it's associated with Down syndrome, Marfan syndrome, uh, craniosynostosis, um, mental retardation, and osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, cornea plana is a very unusual condition. This is a very, very flat cornea, and there's no um, kind of area that you can point to that is the limbus. Uh, the corneal curvature um, is about the same as the adjacent sclera, and this, um, this condition occurs when the second wave of neural crest um, migration fails to form the limbal angle. Um, the Ks uh, may be 20 to 30 diopter. Normal keratometry values are about 42 to 45, so very, very flat. Um, patients may have angle closure um, glaucoma or even open angle glaucoma, and it's seen with other anomalies such as sclerocornea, which I'm going to go, over, go into next. Um, and microcornea, and um, uh, there can be associated cataracts, colobomas, is also seen in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, sclerocornea is a non-progressive, non-inflammatory scleralization of the cornea. It's congenital. It's associated with cornea plana in 80% of cases, and, and uh, there's basically no clear cornea, or very, very little clear cornea, and very, very abnormal angle structures. Um, Exenfeld-Riger syndrome, this is more common. Um, this is a spectrum of anterior segment dysgenesis. Um, I think the teaching now, it, it used to, we kind of used to teach all the different um, kind of syndromes within this um, spectrum, but now we kind of talk about the whole spectrum as one. Um, this is usually autosomal dominant. Um, there's always an anteriorly displaced Schwalbe's line, um, also known as posterior embryotoxin. There can be attached iris strands uh, to the uh, anteriorly displaced uh, Schwabe's line, um, as well as hypo, iris hypoplasia and glaucoma in 50% of patients. So here are a few pictures. So 
Um, this is showing kind of anterior displaced Schwalbe's line. It's white right here. This is showing iris strands that are attached to anteriorly displaced Schwalbe's line. Um, this is another picture showing some iris strands coming up. And again, this is the anteriorly displaced Schwalbe's line here, this white line. So if you notice, you'll see this in a lot of patients um, who may not have any issues whatsoever. They're just coming for a routine exam. You'll, you'll see this sometimes, and um, I don't even note it anymore. But if you, know, if you look for it in enough patients, you'll start to see this fairly often. Um, and then this is a gonioscopic view showing these iris strands coming up to uh, Schwalbe's line up there. Um, Peter's anomaly is a uh, congenital central corneal opacity with iris cornea touch. Um, it is bilateral 60% of the time. It is mostly sporadic due to mutations on the PAX6 gene. Um, and there may be cornea lens touch underneath the uh, corneal opacity and it's highly associated with glaucoma and also aniridia. Um, and this is a kind of a pathological specimen showing very thickened cornea. Um, this is the lens where the lens was touching the cornea. And there's no um, endothelium and decimase um, beneath the corneal opacity that's here. So you'll have kind of a thickened cornea, but there's no um, endothelium and decimase down here. Um, Whereas posterior keratoconus, um, which is an indentation of the posterior cornea, um, seen here without protrusion of the anterior surface, um, there can be some overlying stromal haze right here. It's usually unilateral. It's non-progressive. It's, it's sporadic. And in this case, endothelium and decimase membrane are present um, in, underneath the stromal opacity. Um, congenital hereditary stromal dystrophy is a very, very rare um, it is a dominant condition where there are bilateral flaky anterior stromal clouding um, with a clear periphery. It may be a little hard to see here, but there's a clear rim right here. Um, there's no edema, photophobia, photophobia or tearing. Um, posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy seen a little more often. Um, it's still quite rare. It's also autosoma dominant, um, and it is always bilateral. Um, and you'll see gray-white kind of sheet-like stromal opacities uh, posteriorly, so the posterior stroma. Um, and you see more of it in the central cornea, but it does extend out to the limbus. Um, on the slit lamp photo here, you kind of see a little kind of opacity uh, posteriorly. Um, patients have thinner corneas, flatter corneas, uh, but the vision is usually good. Most patients with this condition will have good vision and won't even know they have it. Um, CHED, uh, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy. This is a bilateral congenital corneal edema, and there's two main types, CHED1 and CHED2. Uh, so CHED1 is autosoma dominant. Um, it comes up at age one to two years. It's slowly progressive. It's associated with pain, photophobia, and tearing, and there's no nystagmus. Um, as opposed to CHED2, which is autosomal recessive, and most autosomal recessive conditions just in general, are going to be a lot worse than autosomal dominant conditions. So if you think along those lines, autosomal recessive is actually going to be present at birth. Um, it's not progressive, but there is nystagmus present. Um, and you, there's no tearing and photophobia, which you'll see in CHED1. Um, congenital glaucoma um, presents at birth or within the first few years of life. There's a classic triad of uh, tearing, photophobia, and blepharospasm. And then bupthalmus is the term that's used um, exclusively for congenital glaucoma, uh, where there's a corneal diameter of greater than uh, 10 millimeters. Um, corneal edema is seen in 25% of patients at birth and greater than 60% by six months. Um, classically, you'll see Hobbs striae, which are breaks in decimase membrane that are usually horizontal. Um, so this is a picture of bilateral congenital glaucoma. You can see corneal clouding and edema. And then these are Hobbs striae, which are horizontal, and this is what it looks like under retroillumination. Um, birth trauma can look similar um, as opposed to, uh, with regards to the striae. So birth trauma, um, you'll see progressive corneal edema during the first few days of life, and it's, um, you'll see typically vertical or oblique striae rather than horizontal striae. Um, and the edema may clear later, but it can recur later in life. Um, so here are some pictures of birth trauma. This is some diffuse 
um, edema. I'm not sure if this is the same patient or not, but you can see some um, kind of oblique vertical um, stria here, some more vertical stria here, and then here's some that are seen our retroillumination. Um, interstitial keratitis, this develops in the first decade of life and uh, leads to a rapidly progressive corneal edema followed by a deep new vascularization. And the cornea may actually become pink, um, and this is a salmon patch of the cornea. Um, and then um, once the new vascularization kind of fades away, ghost vessels are left behind in the stroma, which you can see here. So these are not, there's no blood really going through them, they're just kind of the ghost vessels. Um, etiologies of interstitial keratitis, most common being HSV and congenital syphilis. However, there are other rarer conditions you need to think about, such as Lyme disease, TB, um, zoster, and Kogan syndrome, um, which you'll see, uh, which is by uh, autoimmune condition, which is associated with vestibulo auditory deficits. Um, I talked about congenital corneal keloids a couple weeks ago in the lecture. Um, this is a typically bilateral um, condition. Um, you'll see it in low syndrome, which is oculocerebrorenal syndrome, with thick collagenase bundles, and it may look something like this, like a almost like a pseudoterygium, but it doesn't necessarily have to have um, all this vasculature. Earlier on, it can look like a Salzman nodule. Um, congenital corneal anesthesia. Um, so patients with this will have bilateral <coughs> painless corneal opacities and ulcerations. And the corneal or the anesthesia could be limited just to the cornea, or it can um, there there can also be anesthesia of um, other tissues that are innervated by the trigeminal trigeminal nerve. Um, so this is just I mean this is going to be the ultimate um, neurotrophic keratitis. So got to treat very aggressively with lubrication, lid taping. Might consider lateral tarsorphy. Um, this is a young child who probably has not just corneal, bilateral corneal anesthesia, but probably anesthesia of other facial structures because there's a lot of kind of uh, injuries to the face. She's, he or she's wearing a helmet, so you know they're not able to feel um, pain, so they're more likely to hurt themselves. Um, ice syndrome is um, uh, iridocorneal endothelial syndrome, and this there's kind of a lot of unknowns regarding this syndrome. It might be congenital, which is why I threw it in this talk, um, but it doesn't become apparent until middle age. The genetics are unknown. It's um, usually female. It's pretty much always unilateral. And what happens is the endothelial cells of the cornea start to act like epithelial cells. So epithelial cells like to proliferate and kind of form sheets. And so the endothelium starts to do that. And as you can imagine, these abnormal cells start to proliferate. Um, they can grow into the angle, onto the iris, um, producing iris abnormalities um, and glaucoma. And these abnormal cells can actually, um, you know, because they're not, you know, acting like normal corneal endothelium, um, they're going to lead to a malfunction of the endothelial cells, producing corneal edema. Um, you can treat this with endothelial keratoplasty or a PK. Um, the glaucoma can be difficult to treat, and with either glaucoma surgery or um, corneal surgery, it, it can recur because you're not going to be getting rid of all of the abnormal endothelial cells. There's always going to be something that's left over, so these cells can start to clog up trabeculectomies, clog up tube shunts. Um, it can still recur um, in a PK or a DSEG. Um, and I don't know if the books still go over the three subclassifications of ice syndrome or not. I thought the, I thought the book was going the books were going to go away from, from that, but um, in the event that you still need to know the three um, subcategories, there's a nice kind of built-in mnemonic for these syndromes. So ICE, ICE, I stands for Iris Nevis syndrome, which is seen here. Um, see these tiny little bumps on the iris which look like nevi. They're not really nevi. This is happening because of um, kind of contracture of these cells um, over the surface of the uh, iris. Um, Chandler syndrome, you see corneal um, edema as being the main issue here. E um, stands for essential iris atrophy, um, where you see atrophic um, thinning and even holes in the iris. So. That's ice syndrome.
think that's it for my talk. It's really short. Um, we can go over other conditions or other questions on anything you've seen. You'll see a lot of congenital things and obviously on peds. So I don't know if anyone wanted to bring up any cases or issues, patients they've seen. No. Okay. Well, that's it. <laughs>